Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We're beginning today by talking about disease and insect pressure in spring crops. Joining us now is Tom Royer, our extension entomologist. And Tom, we're hearing some about army cutworms. What are producers telling you? Yes, uh, producers are saying, especially in canola fields uh, throughout the state, they're finding sometimes low levels, but sometimes very seriously damaging levels. Um, and this is a time of year when the cutworms are big enough that they can start causing damage to the, the crop itself taking out stand, um, all kinds of things. So uh, all kinds of bad things for the canola. So this is a time for all producers to get out and check their fields to make sure uh, they don't have a, a significant infestation that they have to deal with. And you're also keeping an eye on alfalfa and wheat fields as well, yes. right? Yes, army cutworm uh, will attack any one of those crops, particularly alfalfa that's in its first year of planting. Um, the cutworm itself likes to uh, lay eggs in bare soil, so anything that was tilled up in the fall is, is kind of a landing field for the moths as they're coming in and laying eggs. So canola is really susceptible because we typically have to have pretty clean fields to plant. Uh, wheat is planted over a longer period of time, so they're a little more inconsistent in wheat, but uh, alfalfa is the same way. If it's a newly planted alfalfa field, they can come in and cause problems uh, until it gets established. Now, in terms of scouting, what should producers look for in the field? Um, army cutworms like to hide during the day. They like to hide under the soil, so you really have to uh, turn into a 10-year-old kid, get down on the ground, stir up the soil, and look for them. Um, that's the best scouting method we have. Um, our thresholds are all based on so many per square or per square foot, so uh, you just have to stir up the soil. If you're in a wheat field and you have some old cow patties out there, you got to turn those over because they like to hide under those too. In terms of treatment options, there are some things to consider. Yes, um, one of the good things about army cutworms is that they're easy to kill with the. Uh, with the registered insecticides we have. Many of the pyrethers are very sensitive to them, so if you have a, a treatment threshold that's been reached, um, any of the uh, registered pyrethroid insecticides are very effective. Okay, Tom Royer, thanks a lot. And now let's look at some disease issues currently in Oklahoma with our extension wheat pathologist, Bob Hunger. Well, mostly from south central, southwestern Oklahoma, there's been reports of uh, leaf rust, but even more so stripe rust uh, occurring across that, that part of the state. And uh, uh, there's, there are some heavy areas in Texas as well, and of course that inoculum blows from south to north and uh, is starting the infection process in southern Oklahoma. So does that mean if the conditions are right, it'll move north then? Yes, and we've had uh, ideal conditions over the last week or week and a half. Uh, the temperatures have become more mild. We've had uh, lots of dews, some light rains, uh, creating a lot of free moisture on the leaves and so uh, as that inoculum blows up from the south it has favorable temperature and moisture and the infections will spread further north but we haven't seen any yet around Stillwater. Now we haven't had to talk about this in a while because it's been so dry but with the moisture this year it definitely is a concern? Oh definitely yeah I'm, I'm expecting that over the next week or so because we have more rain and mild temperatures in the forecast there should be spreading of leaf rust and possibly stripe rust too coming from southern Oklahoma up across uh, Oklahoma and then in, even into Kansas. Should producers go out and scout and if so what should they look for? Yeah, they should know uh, what varieties they have, resistance and susceptibility of those varieties to the diseases, but they definitely should be looking for leaf rust and stripe rust, and especially stripe rust because it's a little bit more aggressive, it can cause a little more damage, and in some cases in uh, Texas and in, in southern Oklahoma, there has been some spraying done to uh, curtail these early season infections, but if you put a fungicide on this early, if uh, disease conditions persist through the season, definitely a second application will be required further on down the road. And that was my next question, treatment options. I mean, there are some ways to address the, these issues. 
<clears throat> yeah, at this point, it would it would be with fungicides. Uh, fungicides uh, you can put on two applications. Most growers would prefer to use just one, but if you have heavy infestation uh, this time of year, you may need to put on an early application. But uh, growers need to be careful not to overuse a fungicide. They sh should switch chemistries between the first and second application. And with some fungicides, there's maximum amounts that can be used in a season, so they want to make sure they don't ex ex uh, exceed that amount. Okay, switching gears a little bit, we're standing here in your research nursery where you've worked for the past 30 years. Tell us about some of the things that you've addressed and some of the progress that's been made in terms of disease. Linda, this, this is a, a real success story in this nursery. Uh, when I came in the early 80s to Oklahoma State, the, the breeding program was almost 100% uh, of the lines would have been susceptible to a disease called soil-borne mosaic virus, wheat soil-borne mosaic virus. And you can see the symptoms of that disease in this nursery here. Uh, since that time, because of the uh, breeding process, uh, now well over 95, even 98 percent of the lines in the breeding program are resistant to soil-borne and spindle streak virus. And that's what is going on in this nursery. There's over 1,800 lines, breeder lines, planted in this and I'll be going through them through the next week or two to identify those that are resistant and those that are susceptible and of course the susceptible ones will get left behind and the resistant ones will move forward. And then the process continues. Every year, yeah, every okay. year. <laughs> Bob Hunger, thanks a lot, some great information. Our wheat pathologist here at Oklahoma State University. We're only about a month to six weeks away from the start of the spring breeding season, so now's a good time to make sure our bull battery is ready for that particular purpose. Many, many production bull sales are going on all across the Midwest, and so if you're out purchasing a new young bull, one of the things I would suggest is that we bring him home as soon as possible and try to let him down nutritionally if he'd been eating a, quite a bit of grain in, at his previous owner's place, we want to start substituting more forage into his diet because he's going to be on an almost totally forage diet when he goes into the breeding season. We want to get his rumen ready for that particular event. Now, if we're going to have several sires in the same breeding pasture, now's a good time to put those bulls together. They're going to sort out who's king of the mountain. They're going to develop that social hierarchy. So let's get the fighting done ahead of the breeding season so they're not doing it during the first week of the breeding season when we'd like to get a lot of cows bred. This would be a good time to check the feet of the bulls that we're going to use. If they need to be trimmed, let's contact our local veterinarian or whoever's going to help us trim those bulls' feet and get that done at least 30 days prior to the breeding season so that there's no chance that they have lameness or soreness going into the breeding season when we want them to be able to travel quite a little bit. If we're going to use young bulls and older bulls, let's put the young bulls together and the older bulls together. I think we'll have a less chance of an injury occurring during the fighting process of a bigger older bull beating up that, that younger bull. And if we're planning to rotate bulls during our breeding season, I'd suggest that we start with the mature bulls first, putting them out for the first two thirds of the breeding season, then bring in those young yearling bulls. It allows them to have fewer cows to breed plus the fact that they're a month to six weeks older in age and more likely to be sexually mature. Doing just a few of these simple things in terms of management can help us have a more successful breeding season with the bull battery that we've got on our place and therefore a higher calf crop the following year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. A reminder now about upcoming farm bill deadlines with Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist. And Jody, we're closing in on March 31st, which is a key date. Yeah, the deadline to elect ARC, the Ag Risk Coverage, or PLC, the Price Loss Coverage, is March 31st. The deadline to do the base reallocation and yield update is also March 31st. The deadline originally was in February, but it was actually extended uh, into March, and that's coming up pretty soon. Now, 
Some counties are doing a registration process or county register, I think you called it. Talk about that. In some counties, uh, they can't get everyone in before the deadline. So what they've been doing is have producers call in, make an appointment, get on a register, and then they, they might actually have an appointment scheduled after March 31st. So I've had a lot of people asking, well, do I get to go in after March 31st? Well, my suggestion is make sure that, that you call your county office and at least make an appointment, get on the register. Don't just assume you can go in after March 31st and then call them after March 31st because if that happens uh, you may miss the deadline. And that's the county FSA office? Yeah the county farm service agency office so that would be each county whichever producer is their administrative county they'll call that office and just make sure they do that before March 31st. And it's county by county it's not necessarily a statewide thing? County by county. Okay. Do we think these deadlines will be extended yet again? I know you're getting some questions on that. Yeah, you know, there's there's always a possibility, but I would say at this point, don't depend on it. Make sure that, that you call your, your county office and set up your appointment prior to March 31st. And again, the appointment may actually take place after March 31st, but make sure that, that, that you get in to do it and call before the deadline. And then if it happens to, you know, get extended, then we can deal with that later. Now we've spent a lot of time in the last year talking with you about the farm bill, but your time at OSU and with extension is winding down. You're on to a new opportunity. Tell us a little bit about that. So I've, I've taken a new position with the National Cotton Council in Tennessee and I'll be the chief economist for the Cotton Council. I'll actually be doing a lot of similar analysis on policy issues, uh, this time mostly just related to cotton. And I will be back around Oklahoma and doing analysis for Oklahoma producers as well. Well, hopefully we'll see you again. Jody. thanks for all the work you've done helping Oklahoma producers and landowners and, of course, sign up viewers, sort out farm bill details, and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Jody Campici, our Ag Policy Specialist. Here we are the second day in spring and usually there's a spring rally and Kim are we seeing that this year? Well we've uh, had a 39 cent uh, price increase of wheat it backed off about a nickel this week uh, you know let's just hope that this rally keeps going. Okay now we've been away for about three weeks get us caught up on what all's been happening in the markets. Well the elephant in the room is the, uh, the value of the dollar or that dollar index relative to other currencies uh, we saw that increase another three percent over the last couple of weeks because you'd think that would be negative for the grain prices due to exports. Uh, you look at oil prices they're down 16 percent gas prices lower that's that's neat because I need to fill up my car and my truck. <laughs> Uh, you've got corn prices down in, uh, five percent. You got soybeans down seven percent, and you got wheat prices up about uh, oh around four percent. And as we get closer to harvest, what do you think the markets are going to be offering whenever the when the crops come in? Well, if we look at uh, forward contract prices right now on corn, it, they're bid off the December contract. It's around three dollars and ninety-five cents. Around the state, uh, the basis forward contract basis is a minus forty-five cents to a minus twenty. And most of Oklahoma, if you go out in the panhandle it's a plus 20 cents mm -hmm. so you got the forward contract for corn from 350 to 375 in Oklahoma panhandle area around 415 now sor sorghum's at a premium it's uh, the basis is a minus 7 cents to a positive 10 cents or 388 to 405 Soybeans, uh, the basis is a minus 90. The, it's off the November contract, it's $9.40. So that'll give you about $8.50 for a forward contract for beans. Uh, wheat, uh, Kansas City July contract, around $5.50. Oklahoma, the basis of minus 50 in the south, uh, minus 10 to the north. So that'll give you a forward contract from $5 to $5.40. And then canola, canola is really in the tank. Uh, anywhere from five sixty eight to six dollars and twelve cents that's quite a stark difference than from, from say a couple of years ago you bet canola prices you know you go back a couple of years ago we had twelve thirteen dollars uh, uh last year around uh, eight or nine dollars uh, this uh the six dollar price of canola is below the cost of production and something's going to have to give there for us to continue to produce it Okay, so we changed gears a little bit. Let's look into the Kim Anderson crystal ball. What do you see for prices in the future? Well, there's a lot happening in the next next few weeks. On, uh, on March 31st, the USDA will release the summer crop 
uh, planted acres or the planting intentions, their, their expectations are mm -hmm. protection. So we don't know what our corn acres, bean acres, soy, corn, cotton, all those acres. We don't know what those acres are going to be, so that's a big note. And then you got the, uh, that dollar index, the value of the dollar. It's moving quite a bit. If it goes up, prices are going to go down. If it goes down, prices are going to go up. With all the unknowns, there's not much telling what prices are going to do except waller around for the next week until we get into April and see what this crop's like. It's the time to just stay out of the market and see what's going to happen. Okay, and, and when, when people do get back in the market, you'll be there. You bet. Okay. We're always here. Okay, Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mezzanine Weather Report. The good news this winter has been the number of rain and snow events we've had in the state. The bad news has been the amount of precipitation that has come through with some of these events. The amounts have been on the light side for too many areas in Oklahoma. Tuesday's rain was like that. A 24-hour map from Wednesday afternoon only had two locations with more than a half inch of rain. Antlers with 72 hundredths and Broken Bow with 55 hundredths. Too many mesonet sites were in light blue areas, a tenth of an inch or less of rain. So how are we faring for moisture as spring begins? Maps of the water year that begins October 1st give us a good marker. Let's look back one year to the water year that began on October 1st, 2013 and went through March 15th, 2014. This map had only a few olive green areas that were between 80 and 100 percent of normal. The yellow areas were between 60 and 80 percent of normal. The extensive light orange areas were 40 to 60 percent of normal rainfall. The orange-red areas fall between 20 and 40 percent of normal. In the dark red spot, rainfall was less than 20 percent of normal. Flipping to a map of our current water year from October 1, 2014 to March 15, 2015, conditions are much more encouraging. A number of places are colored light green, indicating they have received more than 100% of their normal rainfall. There are no areas below 40% of normal. The light orange areas, 40 to 60% of normal, cover much less area. Another way to compare these two water years is in their departure from normal rainfall. The departure in rainfall from 2013 through March 15, 2014 had a large area of light orange representing 4 to 6 inches below normal rainfall. The orange-red areas were 6 to 8 inches below normal. This water year from October 1, 2014 to March 15, 2015 has only a few scattered areas of light orange, 4 to 6 inches below normal. The yellow areas at 2 to 4 inches below normal fill much of the state. And what is more encouraging are the scattered green areas of above normal rainfall. So we've had a better year for winter moisture than the winter of 2013 to 2014. A soil moisture map from Wednesday has much of the state colored green, 80 to 100 percent of plant available water from the surface down to 16 inches. Hollis and May Ranch are the only locations below 40 percent plant available water. A deeper look at soil moisture from Wednesday shows our drier, deeper soils on a map of plant available water from the surface down to 32 inches. The areas with less than 40 percent of plant available water expand across the western half of the state and in the panhandle, the tan and brown areas. Way out west, the folks in Boise City have soil moisture worth celebrating. 94% of plant available water in the top 32 inches of soil. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. We're talking water use and irrigation in Oklahoma with Sala Tagvian, our extension specialist in water resources. And Sala, you've been looking at the latest report from the USDA. Let's talk about irrigated acres. Start with that. Um, yeah, according to this survey, which was conducted in 2013, 
Uh, we had about uh, 430,000 acres of irrigated land in Oklahoma. Uh, now this is uh, close to where we always have been, about uh, a little less than half a million acres. And the amount of water that was applied to this irrigated acres was little over uh, about half a million uh, acre feet of water, which if you translate to gallons, it's uh, over 170 billion gallons of water applied to, to these lands. Um, now, if you look at all the 50 estates and rank the estates based on the acreage of irrigated lands, we're right in the middle, uh, number 26 in, ten, in terms of total irrigated area. We talk a lot about water in Oklahoma, of course, especially these last few years of drought. Where are most producers getting their water from? Uh, very interesting. In, in Oklahoma, we get about 92% of our irrigation water from, from groundwater resources. Now, this is significant. And if you look at the uh, previous uh, irrigation survey that was conducted in 2008, that number was 83%. This shows that we are relying more and more on our groundwater resources in Oklahoma. The extraction of groundwater uh, is uh, done using about 5,000 irrigation wells across the state. And another piece of information that's interesting and a little bit concerning is that the average well capacity in 2013 was 408 gallons per minute, uh, according to the survey results. This number in 2008 was 505 gallons per minute. So we see a significant decline in well capacities, which will have a significant impact on our irrigation capacity. And then that leads us to the next question. What type of systems do producers have in Oklahoma? The most uh, dominant type of irrigation system is center pivot irrigation systems. And um, among different types of center pivots, over 70% of them are um, low pressure center pivot system. And these are the systems with uh, lower nozzles and they require less pressure to apply water. And as a result of that, we get better efficiencies with that because the wind drift and evaporation of uh, water droplets are minimized under the low pressure uh, center pivot irrigation systems. And then in terms of crops, which type of crops in Oklahoma get the most irrigated water? The two top irrigated crops in Oklahoma in 2013 uh, their uh, grain, corn, and, and wheat, each with about 100,000 acres of irrigated land. Uh, one a big change that we noticed in 2013 compared to 2008 was irrigated cotton because of the drought situation in southwest Oklahoma. Uh, we've had about 60,000 acres of irrigated cotton in the past. This number dropped to 26,000 acres in 2013 which shows the, the significant impact that the drought has had on, on cotton production in Oklahoma. You and the team have a big week coming up. It's World Water Week. Yes, uh, we, we have uh, organized lots of uh, interesting activities. It starts with the World Water Day on March 23rd. Uh, we have uh, activities including uh, screening of uh, doc movies and documentaries about water. Uh, in o in U United States and Oklahoma, we have um, a 40-gallon challenge that we encourage all the Oklahomans to, to take pledge and participate in. And we also have the student water conference at the end of the OSU Water Week. Sounds terrific. Okay, Sala Tagbian, thank you very much. And for more information on World Water Week and a link to the fact sheet that looks at irrigation in Oklahoma, just go to the SUNUP website, sunup.okstate.edu. Well, it's been a few weeks since we've had an opportunity to talk with Daryl Peel. And Daryl, let's run back over the past month. What's new in the cattle markets? Well, for the most part, prices have kind of stabilized. We had some, you know, some uh, adjustment in the markets really in January and early February. They've kind of stabilized now pretty much at all levels. Feeder cattle prices have actually recuperated a little bit, picking up a little strength on the lighter weight cattle in particular as we move towards spring. Box beef and fed cattle prices just holding pretty steady uh, for the most part. Let's look at the supply and demand numbers right now. Let's, let's start with supply. 
Well, you know, the, the big picture, of course, is that supplies are tight. Certainly from a feeder cattle perspective, uh, supplies will be tight all of this year, and that's the, the, the big underlying support. Um, we're getting, uh, you know, a little bit less cattle probably this year relative to last year from Canada and Mexico. That's going to keep supplies tight, and we're continuing to retain heifers. Seasonally, of course, fed cattle supplies will increase a little bit between now and about June. So we'll see some, you know, some seasonal pressure there on those on the uh, on the fed cattle market and, and on the wholesale beef market as we move into that time frame. So as we move into the demand side, let's talk about that. Well, demand's been kind of a cap here recently. Uh, uh, you know, there's several factors going on through the winter time. We've had lots of cold weather in lots of places that hasn't helped beef demand. Uh, we've, we, you know, we've had increasing supplies of pork and poultry, which continue to weigh on the market. Again, tight supplies fundamentally is supporting box beef prices, but holding them more steady than anything. We're going to move into the summer grilling period here. We're looking for some seasonal increase in box beef demand as we move over the next uh, month or so. Are cattle moving in and out of the U.S. right now? Well, again, we're, we are, we're still importing cattle from Canada and Mexico, but uh, a little less so. The, the import numbers from last year, or from January, were down a little bit from last year for feeder cattle and for slaughter cattle. Okay, and are, are we getting any trade with Mexico right now? The, uh, you know, the trade numbers for January were pretty disappointing in a lot of ways, and we've got several things going on that really affect beef. Beef prices, of course, are already high in the U.S. The strength in the U.S. dollar has made exports even more expensive. It's also made imports more attractive, so we're importing more, we're exporting less. And then, of course, the dock uh, situation on the West Coast slowed things down, caused some logistical problems that still aren't uh, completely uh, taken care of, so that adds added uh, more pressure to it. And again, the supplies of pork and poultry compared to, uh, and, and the slow exports of those uh, adds to the problem. Boy, I feel like we're all caught up now. Okay, a, a month worth of data right there. Okay, thank you much, Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Thanks so much for joining us this week. A reminder, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout, have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time at Sunup.